Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today I'm going through a video on designing experiments. This is basically for GCSE Biology and I have included for examples after the description. The content covered includes details for designing an experiment, usually for the five more question in IGCSE Biology, as well as information on presenting experimental results in tables as well as graphs. And I've included how to choose a suitable graph and here, if you've looked at so many mark schemes, they use the C O R M1, M2, S1, S2, where C is conditions for the independent variable, or is for the organisms that are involved, R is for the repeat experiments that have to be carried out, M1 is for the measurement of the dependent variable, M2 respective of time, meaning the experimental time, S1 and S2 could be any variables that have to be controlled. The first one is about conditions for the independent variable. We have to state how the independent variable should be varied. This could be light intensity, it could be concentration of something. Sometimes you need to dilute to different concentrations. It could be carbon dioxide concentration or any abiotic variable that has to be varied in your experiment. So you have to state how they're going to be varied. And it's good that you include a contra experiment in your description of how the independent variable is going to be varied, meaning include maybe if it's concentration of something, you could include an experiment with zero concentration. The next one is about organisms that are involved, because in most biological experiments, you're going to be working with organisms. It could be plant material or plant tissues. It could be any other organisms that are being studied in an experiment. So we have to make sure they are of the same species, they are of the same age, and maybe mass. Basically, the conditions of the organisms have to be made constant so that the only differences in the results are due to the changes that have occurred in the independent variable. These help us to maintain consistency for all experiments that are carried out so that the results can be valid. The R is for repeating the experiment. Remember to repeat the experiment at all conditions of the independent variable, and then we usually calculate the mean. Here we will rule out results that are not valid, meaning those that are anomalous, so this is going to ensure reliability as well as validity of the results. M1 is for measuring the dependent variable. Here we have to state how the dependent variable is going to be measured. This involves quantifying the outcome or a response that is being studied. It could include anything from the growth of a particular organism, the concentration of a chemical in a sample, the rate of enzyme activity, or the behavior of cells in response to certain stimuli. Depending on the nature of the dependent variable, various techniques may be used in the measurement. And again, remember, the accuracy and precision of these measurements are very important in drawing meaningful conclusions from the experiment. M2 is for measurement of the experimental time. It has to be stated. This is going to be important, more so if you're calculating rate, because to obtain any rate, we have to divide by the time the experiment was carried out. Going to S1 and S2, which are the standards, we know that certain variables have to be kept constant, and this could include the temperature using a water bath, light intensity by controlling the distance of the lamp from the experimental setup, carbon dioxide concentration, pH, and many more. The first example could be, describe an experiment to investigate the effect of different concentrations of salt on the germination of mung beans, include details on variables to be controlled, the procedure and how the dependent variable, meaning the germination rate, will be measured and recorded. Discussion is focusing on the effect of different concentrations of salt, so we have to find ways of getting the different concentrations of salt, and that is going to be in the part of how we change the independent variable. So we could say, prepare petri dishes with filter paper, and even they distribute mung bean seeds on the filter paper, then add different concentrations of salt solution this could be 0%, 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, and so on. This is up to you. So the beans should be of the same species, edge, and they should be the same number on all the petri dishes that we're carrying out the experiment with. So we'll repeat the experiment at each concentration of salt and calculate the mean. Then we count the number of mung beans that have germinated within a certain time. This could be a week. While experimenting, we have to keep the temperature, light intensity, water availability, and seed quality the same. Then we can calculate the germination rate 
as a percentage of seeds that have germinated in each dish. So then we can draw the table with labels and units, including columns for the salt concentration, which is the independent variable, as well as the dependent variable, which is going to be the corresponding rates. And also we include our column for the means, because means have to be calculated in order for us to believe that the results were accurate or that the results are valid. Example 2. Describe an experiment to study the effect of pH on the rate of catalase enzyme activity using hydrogen peroxide as the substrate. In this experiment, hydrogen peroxide is converted into oxygen with the help of catalase enzyme. If we are studying how changes to pH affect the enzyme, it means we have to collect the volume of gas which is oxygen produced within a certain time, and then we can be able to know which pH is going to create the highest or lowest rate. So to answer this question, I could say, set up test tubes containing catalase enzyme at five different pH values. This could be pH 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11. And again, remember the enzymes are going to be in solution, so they should be the same concentration and volume for this experiment to be fair. Then repeat experiments should be carried out at all pH values. And then add equal volumes of hydrogen peroxide to each test tube uh, containing the enzyme and then start a timer and immediately measure the volume of oxygen produced using a gas syringe. Then calculate the rate by dividing the volume of gas produced by the specific time, meaning this is going to be volume divided by the time. And in this experiment, we have to keep the temperature, concentration of hydrogen peroxide, which is the substrate, as well as duration of the reaction, constant. In question 3, design an experiment to investigate the effect of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis in spinach leaves. Experiments on light intensity are very common, so you have to try to understand how to answer this question. So we are changing the light intensity and we are studying how this is affecting the rate of photosynthesis. Since photosynthesis produces oxygen, we're going to collect the volume of oxygen produced within a specific time at the different light intensities, and then we see which light intensity gives the greatest rate. Light intensity is going to be the independent variable. So I can say, set up five different experiments, exposing the leaves to different light intensities by varying the distance between the leaves and the light source. In this case, the source of light could be a lamp, and then the leaves should come from the same species of spinach. If possible, they should come from the same spinach plant and if not, then they should be the same age and species. Then carry out repeat experiments at each light intensity, and these will be used to calculate the mean if we roll out the anomalous results. You'll use a glass funnel attached to an inverted graduated cylinder filled with water to collect and measure the volume of oxygen gas released by the leaves over time. The rate of oxygen production will be determined by measuring the volume of oxygen gas collected in the graduated cylinder at regular intervals or at regular time intervals. Then the spinach leaves should be placed in the test tube containing a bicarbonate solution. This bicarbonate solution is going to provide the carbon dioxide because this experiment is going to be carried out in solution, so carbon dioxide has to be provided using bicarbonate. Then keep the temperature, carbon dioxide concentration, water availability, leaf surface area, and light intensity the same. And again, this is going to be light intensity the same because every light intensity that is varied, it has to be maintained until we vary the next one. And actually, if we are using the same plants at all the different light intensities, then we have to allow the plants or the leaves in this case time to acclimatize, meaning to get used to the new conditions before we begin to collect the volume of gas. In example four, propose an experiment to investigate the effect of temperature on the rate of fermentation of yeast. In this experiment, we are varying temperature, so temperature is the independent variable. So I could answer this question by saying, prepare several test tubes containing equal volumes of yeast suspension and sugar solution. We set up the experiments incubating at different temperatures, for example, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 and 50 for a specific period of time. The yeast used should be from the same source and the yeast solution should have the same concentration as well as volume. We can carry out repeat experiments at all temperatures and calculate the mean. The rate of carbon dioxide production will be determined by measuring the volume of gas collected in the gas syringe at regular time intervals. 
and we ensure that other variables are controlled, for example, concentration of sugar solution, the pH, the volume of the reaction mixture, and so on. Going on to how results should be presented, results could be presented in tables as well as graphs. The tables should have clear headings and labels. Include labels and units in the table and ensure that the independent variable is to the left while the dependent variable is to the right. Also include a column for means. So we need to calculate the means from repeat experiments and then we include that in the table and sometimes in calculation of the mean, we could exclude anomalous results. The choice of graph depends on the data that is presented before you. It could be a bar graph or a line graph depending on the nature of the results. So to draw a bar graph, it means there is no gradation in the independent variable. However, if there is gradation, then we can use a line graph. The next part is headings and labels. These have to be clearly shown. The independent variable has to be placed on the horizontal axis while the dependent variable is going to be on the vertical axis. So you use a specific scale that is appropriate, include labels as well as units, and the points have to be plotted appropriately. Then the provided space, which could be a graph paper, use more than 50% of the provided space. I usually recommend 75%, but in the exams they allow at least higher than 50%. If you've used that space, then it means you're going to get for marks for that. Now, awarding marks for IGCSE biology graphs, they use S standing for scale, L could be for line as well as labels, A could be for axis, and P could be for points. If you include suitable vertical and horizontal axis, clearly labeled with units, and then use a suitable scale, and your points are plotted appropriately, the lines are drawn clearly and neatly, then you can get full marks on a graph. So this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.